Good morning and happy Easter. As people have said over and over, this is a very non-traditional Easter, but I hope you're doing well and that you're weathering this crisis as tolerably as possible. This morning, we're on lesson four of our study of Romans and the verses we're going to cover are Romans chapter three, verses 20 through chapter four, verse three. As a reminder, I'll be reading from the ESV translation. If you'd prefer to use your own translation, just pause the video until you found it and are ready to continue. In today's lesson, Paul has finished his discussion of God's judgment and the equal guilt of the Jew and Gentiles and is moving into God's redemption. It's funny how things work out because this week, Karen told me a story that I thought tied into the lesson really well. Karen and I have a friend whose husband is a town official in a small town here in Texas. She was on her way to work one morning with speeding. It wasn't that she wasn't paying attention. She knew she was speeding, but she was late, and she was trying to get there as soon as possible. Wouldn't you know it, she got pulled over by the local police. She was guilty. She had no excuse. She had been speeding on purpose to get to work. The officer took her driver's license and studied it a minute. Realizing who her husband was, he handed it back to her and said, you should probably slow down. To make things worse, before she could even get to the office, she got a call from her husband. She was guilty, no two ways around it, but because of who she knew, she escaped judgment. As I thought about today's lesson, it struck me that's just like us in our spiritual life. We're all guilty of sin. The last two lessons have made it really clear. We're imperfect. We can never measure up to God's standard of perfection when it comes to sin. We deserve the judgment of God, but because we know Jesus, we can be absolved of our sins and escape judgment. Paul has spent over two chapters of the book of Romans telling the church of Rome that they too are guilty under the law, Jews and Gentiles alike. Verse 20 could be a summation of that topic. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul uses the phrase, quote, works of the law. Paul is talking about those rules or laws by which the Jews and Gentiles pretended to frame their lives. He confirms that no one could be justified, even if they had conformed to those laws. For the Jews, he's specifically saying that even if they had followed the ceremonial laws within the law of Moses, they had failed moral laws and therefore couldn't be justified by the law. No law made by reason, conscience, or tradition could be justified, and there could be no form of obedience that we could hope to achieve that would justify people in the sight of a holy God. In today's lesson, Paul is going to tell the church at Rome about the redemption that comes through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Verses 21 through 23. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul uses the phrase, but now, to contrast that previous discussion about the judgment of God with his following discussion about the righteousness of God. If you'll recall at the beginning of the letter, Paul identified the gospel as, quote, the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Verse 17, for in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written. The righteous shall live by faith. Paraphrasing verse 17, Paul says that the righteousness of God is revealed in the gospel and beginning and ending in faith. In the verse we just read, Paul made it clear that no one, whether Jew or Gentile, could expect to be made right with God through works of the law. Through the law, we know only the presence of sin, for the righteousness of God has been made known apart from the law. And thankfully for us, there's a new covenant. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. And speaking of a new covenant, he makes the first one obsolete. And what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. The covenant based on the law had been suspended. 
so that everyone who believes, whether Jew or Gentile, has access to God's righteousness apart from adhering to the regulations of the law. Certainly, there's a discontinuity between the Old Covenant and God's revelation of his righteousness in Christ, but there's continuity as well. Paul says, quote, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The phrase, the law and the prophets, refers to the Old Testament, specifically as it bears witness to God's righteousness. Paul has already stated that a right standing before God can't be achieved through human effort under the old system of the law. But the Old Testament does attest to God's action in providing righteousness. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Paul's words echo Jeremiah's prophecy of a new covenant written on people's hearts. The verse says, quote, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Paul repeat, repeats the phrase, quote, the righteousness of God, adding to it another element he originally introduced in Romans 1, verses 16 and 17, the element of faith. The Greek phrase that's translated through faith in Jesus Christ can be understood in two ways. The traditional view is to understand Jesus as the object of the believer's faith. In this view, righteousness is revealed through the believer's faith in Jesus. But the Greek word translated faith can also mean faithfulness. In this view, Paul's point would have been that the righteousness of God has been revealed through the faithfulness of Jesus to, to the Father. Both ideas are obviously true. If Jesus had not been faithful to the Father, then our faith in him would be meaningless. Paul seems to be making the point about the role of faith in the revelation of God's righteousness. Paul reiterated the point by saying, quote, for all who believe. Righteousness is only available through faith in Christ Jesus. But, and this is a very important point, it is available to anyone who has faith. Paul's conclusion here is grounded in his argument in the earlier chapters of his letter, namely there is no distinction between Jews and Gentiles. Paul later uses the same Greek word translated distinction to emphasize the accessibility of the blessings of God in salvation to all who believe. Romans chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The reason there's no distinction is because of the sinful state of all people. Paul used two phrases to describe that sinful relationship. First, Paul says, quote, all have sinned. As we talked about last week, no human, none of us are perfect. Going back to Adam and Eve, we've all sinned. And as a result, we all stand equal into the judgment of God. Second, as a result of that sin, Paul says, quote, we fall short of the glory of God. When saying that we fall short of the glory of God, Paul could have been referring to the glory that had resulted from humans being created in God's image, an image that was marred but not destroyed as a consequence of Adam and Eve's disobedience. Verse 24, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. Just as there is no distinction with regard to our sin before God, there's also no distinction in our access to God's justification. But it's important to note that Paul is not saying that everyone who sinned will be justified, so-called universalism. Universalist or Christian universalism is a school of Christian theology focused around the doctrine that all human beings will ultimately be saved and restored to a right relationship with God. That's not at all what Paul is saying. He's saying everyone has access to that justification, but they have to reach out for it. Based on the sinful standing before God that Paul has already established, we deserve only God's judgment. However, because of Christ, God has rendered a verdict of not guilty. In this verse, Paul described the mode or manner and the means of that verdict. Paul says that we are, quote, are justified by his grace as a gift. God's unmerited love for us led him to offer us something 
that we could never attain through our own effort or ever deserve. We have nothing to offer and depend totally on God's grace. Therefore, our only hope is to receive by faith what has been freely given. Some of you have already heard this story, but it's the best illustration of this point that I've ever heard. When I was probably 10 or 11, I was in church one Sunday when Brother Balky, the preacher at the time, started talking about God's grace. He pulled out a $5 bill and held it up and said, if someone will walk down here and hold out their hand, I'll give them this $5. Well, back then, and we won't say exactly how many years ago that was, $5 was a considerable amount of money to a kid. Everyone in the audience was sort of looking around that I jumped up and hurried down to the front of the sanctuary. He joked and said, uh, yeah, I believe this is a deacon, son, when I took the money, and I hurried back to sit down by this time very embarrassed. As the laughter died down, he said in that booming bass voice of his, did this boy do anything to deserve that money? Everyone shook their heads no. He continued, could he have done anything to deserve that money? Once again, everyone shook their heads no. And then he almost whispered, it was a gift. It was grace. It couldn't be earned, but it could be accepted, but only if he reached out. The redemption of Jesus is available to all, but they have to reach out to receive it. Paul says that the means of our justification is through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The Greek word translated redemption was also used to indicate the liberation of slaves or prisoners of war through the payment of a price. They would be redeemed by paying a price. Paul used that Greek word a total of six times. He used it twice in conjunction with the forgiveness of sins, once in Ephesians, and once in Colossians. He used it twice more in conjunction with the role of the Holy Spirit in securing believers for a future day in which our redemption will be complete. The only other time Paul used the word he connected our redemption to our adoption as children of God. Given Paul's connection between redemption and forgiveness, it's best to understand our redemption as liberation from the sin that placed us under God's judgment. Verses 25 and 26. Whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. I don't know about you guys, but when I originally read this verse, I had no idea what propitiation meant. According to Merriam-Webster, the definition of propitiation is the act of gaining or regaining the favor or goodwill of someone or something. It could also mean an atoning sacrifice. Paul's making a very important point in the initial words of verse 25, quote, whom God put forward as a propitiation. Paul wants us to understand that God is the one who initiated the entire process of redemption. Human beings, and that's the whole of humanity, have nothing to offer that would serve as a sacrifice to atone for our sins. The greatest point of discussion in this verse is the meaning of the Greek word translated propitiation. In the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the same word was used frequently to describe a gold covering over the Ark of the Covenant that had a cherubim on each end. This was otherwise known as the mercy seat. Once a year, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. There he would sprinkle the blood of a pure sacrifice on the mercy seat of the Ark of the Covenant for the atonement for the sins of the people under the first covenant. The Greek word translated put forward could be used to describe what is publicly displayed. Unlike the sprinkling of the goat's blood that was hidden behind the curtain of the Holy of Holies, God publicly presented Jesus as our atoning sacrifice on the cross. The phrase, by his blood, designates the death of Jesus on the cross as the means by which the sacrifice was attained. The benefits of this sacrifice are received through faith. Paul says that all of, quote, this was to show God's righteousness. God's purpose in presenting Jesus as an atoning sacrifice to make clear God's own righteousness. The Greek word that's translated, quote, show, 
appears in only two other New Testament verses, and in both of those cases, it means, quote, to prove. Whether it means to prove or to show, the point is that in the cross, we can see God's righteousness at work. The verse says, quote, because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. The phrase former sins refers to sins committed by mankind before Jesus' sacrificial death initiated a new age of forgiveness and salvation. God, in his restraint, allowed those sins to go unpunished until the cross, whence God's righteous character was demonstrated to the world. God's restraint was designed to allow people to experience the kindness of God that leads to repentance. Just as God's righteousness was seen in his restraint in allowing past sins to go unpunished, so Christ's atoning sacrifice demonstrates God's righteousness in the present age. In the cross, the holy God atoned for sin through the sacrifice of his only son. For that reason, God declares all who have faith in Jesus to be righteous. As believers, we can rest assured that our righteousness is secure in Christ. Verses 27 and 28. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. Paul again uses a series of rhetorical questions and answers about boasting. The initial question challenged the possibility of boasting, a topic that Paul dealt with in chapter 2. Clearly, not all boasting is bad. In Romans chapter 5, verse 2, Paul boasts, quote, in the hope of the glory of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 14, Paul boasts about a fellow, wor a fellow worker. He even boasts in his own weakness in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, saying, quote, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. However, we're not to boast of one's right standing with God. Paul asks, by what kind of law? The meaning of the word law in verse 27 is unclear. Normally, Paul used the word to indicate the law of Moses, but it seems clear here he means principle. Paul then would be comparing the principle of works versus the principle of faith. In either case, works and faith stand in opposition to each other. A law of faith precludes all boasting. Paul rounded off this series of questions with a summary of his earlier teaching, giving more insight into what he meant by the law of faith. Paul had already affirmed in verse 20 that no one could be justified through works of the law. The law or principle of faith meant that the only way one could be right before God was by faith. Since justification only comes through faith in Christ, no ground exists for boasting. Verses 29 through 31. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles only? Yes, of Gentiles only, since God is one. Who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Paul opens verse 29 with the injunction, or. He's changing tactics. If someone could be justified through works of the law, a position that Paul clearly doesn't accept, what would that say about God? A basic tenet of the Jewish faith was that God was one. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. To drive home his point, Paul asks back-to-back -back questions, expecting a different answer for each. Is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles only? He answered the second question, yes, of Gentiles also, implying the answer to the first question. God must be the God of both Jews and Gentiles, or the Gentiles would have no God, since God is one. Paul's conclusion drawn from the two questions of verse 29 was that the one God would justify both the Jews and the Gentiles by faith. Paul used slightly different wording for each group, the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Some Bible teachers have tried to draw a distinction between by faith and through faith, but most of the suggestions for what that distinction would be are highly nuanced and not very convincing. It makes more sense that Paul simply varied the two prepositions for stylistic reasons. Paul's point is clear. God would justify both Jews and Gentiles through faith 
in the atoning sacrifice of Jesus. Faith prohibits boasting. From Paul's emphasis on faith, a reader might surmise the law had no longer any value. Paul answers, quote, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Paul clearly insists on a continuing role for the law, but he doesn't explain here what that claim to uphold the law might mean. His intent is probably what he spells out later in chapter 8. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God did what the law, weakened by sin, couldn't do, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in those who walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh. Romans chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? Paul changes directions and turns to Abraham, using him as a test case for his doctrine of justification by faith apart from works of the law. Paul devotes all of chapter 4 to discussing the various ways Abraham demonstrated that justification came through faith. Abraham was venerated for his relationship with God. Surely if anyone had a right to boast, it would have been Abraham. Verses 2 and 3. For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Paul asked his readers to suppose for the sake of argument that Abraham had been able to justify by works. In that case, Paul argued Abraham would have had a right to boast. However, Paul quickly interjected that Abraham's boasting would not be before God. Some Bible scholars have suggested Paul's point that was Abraham would have had grounds for boasting before other people, but not before God. While the text could be interpreted that way, the context shows that Paul's point of comparison was not between Abraham and others, but between justification by faith and justification by works. The God who justified Abraham by faith was the God who justified the Gentiles and the Jews by faith. Therefore, there were no grounds for boasting at all. To solidify his argument, Paul appealed to Scripture, specifically Genesis 15, 6. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. God was making his covenant with Abraham. He took him outside and told him to look up at the stars and told him to count him if he could. God told him that his offspring would be just as vast, such that you couldn't count them. Verse 6 says, believe in the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. This is the first time the word believe occurs in the Bible, and it's connected with the word righteousness. If you remember the story, Abraham had grown concerned that the promises made in Genesis chapter 12 had not been fulfilled. Rather than a sea of descendants, Abraham had no children, and the child of his slave was his only heir. In response to God's renewed promise in these verses, Abraham trusted God, who, quote, counted it to him as righteousness. Throughout Romans chapter 4, Paul reminded his readers that Abraham's faith came before the sign of circumcision was given to him in chapter 17 of Genesis and before Abraham's signature obedience to God's command to offer Isaac as a sacrifice in Genesis chapter 22. The language, quote, counted it to him as righteousness, Almost sounds like an accounting term, doesn't it? It was counted. Abraham deposited his trust in God's words, which was demonstrated by his willingness to obey. Continuing that accounting metaphor, God recorded Abraham's faith as a credit to his account. Abraham's debt was paid in full by his faith in God, just as our debt is paid through our faith in Jesus Christ. Next week, Jerry is going to cover Lesson 5. The main theme for that lesson is all who accept the gospel find peace with God. The study verses for next week's lesson are Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. If you don't already have a study guide and would like one, they're available at the church. I'd like to leave you today in prayer. Father God, without a doubt, we're in the midst of trying times. 
As Pastor David said during the Good Friday service yesterday, the literal plague is at the door. We would ask that you watch over us and keep us. We would ask blessings on those who are afflicted and those who are attending to them. Heal the afflicted and protect our first responders, nurses, doctors, and staff that are literally putting their lives on the line daily. We can only guess at what greater good may come from this, but we can have peace knowing that you've got this. It's all part of your plan. But our nerves are frayed because of isolation and worry. Help us to be good examples to our friends and neighbors and bring us back together soon that we can renew our fellowship. All these things we ask in your name. Amen.